Thanks. I hope you all drank enough coffee. Um, okay, so let me remind you uh, where we're at. I rewrote just to be able to talk about the, the philosophy, what, what, what we decided to call an Anosov-like action on a, on a plane with two transverse foliations. Uh, it's something that satisfies these axioms, one about the local dynamics when you see a fixed leaf, uh, the, uh, a transitivity type assumption, um, a closing lemma-like assumption, you see a dense set of fixed points. Um, when you have non-separated leaves, there's some element that fixes both. This allows us, like we saw some sketch of last time, to recover uh, structure of lozenges. Um, and in fact, with a bunch of work and heavy use of this axiom, you see whenever there's non-separated leaves, not only is there some element that fixes you know, both non-separated leaves, but if there's various non-separated leaves, there's always some kind of chain of lozenges fixed by this guy, whoop, you know, maybe it looks like this, that contains uh, all the leaves fixed by this particular element. So from this seemingly weak thing, you can reconstruct uh, a big part of the picture of the topology of the plane. And then there's this ad hoc assumption seemingly at the end, which you'll, you know, I'll say a word uh, why we decided that this particular configuration had to be not allowed. Um, yeah? Stabilizer of the no, no. So perhaps if you wanted to prove a theorem like every Anosov-like action comes from a uh, Anosov flow on a three manifold, then you would add this extra assumption. Um, and and uh, uh, but uh, here it can be anything. Yeah. So so. You know, G doesn't resemble sort of a discrete three-manifold group at all a priori. Um, at least in the trivial and skew cases, you can make ex sort of pathological examples of huge groups that act still in Ossoff like OK. okay. Uh, and my final vocabulary word, it, the trivial plane is the one that's just the product foliation on R2. And we understand those, so we'll throw that out sort of right away and discuss non-trivial actions. All right. So my plan, or the theme of this whole mini course, and plan to conclude it today, right, there's been kind of three parts. Well, there was, a, there was a first part due to Thomas, which was why you might care to study these things motivated by the story of Anasov flows acting on their orbit space. Uh, the next is, uh, well, one, you know what? Can you say about you know the structure or the topology, well, I'll say structure maybe, of these two transverse foliations on a plane just from knowing that you have some Anasov-like action on the plane that should constrain what these can look like, not just arbitrary foliations. And the, the second one, oh, and so to this effect we introduce something you might want to look at in terms of your group. Uh, we defined last time, uh, given such an action, which is convenient to write as rho, because I'll want several of them for the same group. I'll label it. Uh, so that's some morphism from here to the homeomorphisms of the plane that preserve the foliations. Uh, that's a Nossov like we define the uh, fancy P because it's motivated by periodic orbits for a flow in that <laughs> dictionary. This is just the set of G so that it acts with a fixed point. Possibly very many. Okay. And so that's like the, you know, if you have a group action, that's sort of the like minimal, I don't know, that's very minimal information you could record from your group, just some set of things that fix points. Um, and so our next part of the plan is to prove, of course I won't be able to prove because it's going to take way too long, but I'll give you some hints. Um, uh, uh, wave hands at, um, 
or give you some hints towards uh, this theorem that says uh, if I have two actions whose fixed point sets agree, then the planes are the same and the actions are conjugate. Uh, unless um, you maybe have some crazy thing that appears called the tree of scalloped regions, and that I will explain today. All right. So this is sort of what we set up last time, and that's what uh, we're going to do. And then three, uh, I will do my best to leave a little time at the end for questions and applications. And that's today. OK, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to start by uh, towards this fixing the lemma that I stated last time. So let's do this. Um, so last time I concluded with some, some hint that, OK, if you know this, you can kind of recover whether your plane is skew or not by this linking and blah, blah, blah. And as you saw, that in an attempt to simplify some complicated work we did, I did not quite correctly thread the needle and was like, and, and you know, anyway, had some hybrid statement of something that wasn't quite true. So that perhaps illustrates some of the nuance of this theory, but I figured out how to correctly thread the needle and give you an, a simple statement that we can prove. So here's, here's a lemma we can do. Um, so I have, uh, let's do part one here which is a skewedness director, a detector, kind of. If I have my non-trivial, sorry, P, F, plus, minus, if this is a skewed plane, and that's an Anasov-like action, OK, and I take two elements that, let's call this row, that have fixed points in my plane, all right, then, For every power of them, uh, if I take alpha to the n, beta to the m, uh, and I look at the action of this element, this also has a fixed point. All right. OK. And uh, why is this true? Let's draw my skew plane. It's the one that sits in this infinite strip. And uh, alpha has a fixed point, say. Uh, maybe it's this point, something in the plane. And the structure of my plane says, right, that I have not only leaves through here, I don't know, up to alpha or alpha inverse, it, one's contracted, one's expanded. Um, but because of the skew plane, this, this leaf makes a perfect fit with a unique other leaf here, this one here, and voila, uh, this one will make a perfect fit with some leaf up here. Um, th this force is not just this fixed point, but an additional one here. Right. And since this is preserved and this is the unique leaf making a perfect fit, it is also preserved by that element. My axiom A whatever says that this leaf being preserved means I have a fixed point. And if you check out the dynamics, uh, as I iterate, things are moved downwards. So now I see this behavior. And I can keep going. And so for alpha, this is just a picture of the dynamics of the action of alpha. I see not just one fixed point, but infinitely many fixed points going up and down my strip. I can repeat this picture forever. Right? And they alternate. If at this point I was expanding uh, the blue foliation, whichever it was, I was expansive on leaves, so this one I'm contracting on the leaf, and so on and so forth. OK, so there's alpha. Let's draw a picture of the dynamics of beta. It has some fixed point somewhere. Um, I guess there's a priori two things that could be different. Maybe it's inside one of these boxes, or maybe it's outside one of these boxes. Uh, the story will go the same either way. Let's draw the picture where, I don't know, it's inside here. Maybe that's my fixed point of beta. Um, and I'll see the same kind of behavior where this propagates up and down. So I haven't colored my foliations red and blue. 
because uh, I wanted to distinguish them from the alpha ones. But just like as in that story, I'll see an infinite chain of fixed points all the way up and down. <coughs> okay. yeah. uh, and uh, they alternate again, so that if at this point I was contracting on leaves of the vertical foliation, at this one I'll be expanding leaves of the vertical foliation. All right. So now I can play the game that I wanted to before, where someone gives me some powers and an M. Uh, let's say they're both positive so that I don't have to switch the arrows on my dynamics. Um, and I try and see what happens if I apply beta to some positive power followed by alpha to some power in this dynamics. Well, I should zoom in on a chunk of leaf space where they are both attracting towards points, say this between this one and this one with the opposite directions. And I look at all the leaves that lie in this strip. That's an interval worth of leaves in my leaf space. I apply some big power of beta. Beta was the one I drew in yellow. It gets contracted up. I apply some big power of beta. This union of leaves gets smooshed down, but it stays within itself. So I find somewhere in here uh, a fixed leaf, and therefore by axiom one a fixed point. And the worry I got into last time with a subtlety of like, well, what if n and m were positive versus negative, whatever, is totally resolved in this case because I see these alternating, extracting, expanding, contracting points. Okay. All right. Uh, fixed leaves, hence fixed point. Okay. On the other hand, if uh, I act on some not non-trivial and non-skew plane with an Anasov-like action, I claim that there exist two elements that fix points in my plane, and there exist powers of them. Uh, actually, I won't. Yeah, I'll need to pass to powers. So that alpha to the n composed with beta to the m uh, does not act with a fixed point. Okay. And this is the proof from last time uh, once I set it up correctly. Okay. Oh, oops. Yes. You know the mathematician says A writes B means C, but it's actually D. Um, thanks for catching that. Okay, so the proof um, is, okay, so what do I know? I'm non-skew, non-trivial. Let's use some things we did last time. Uh, that what does non-skew mean? By the trichotomy theorem, it means I have some non-separated leaves. So there exist non-separated L1, L prime and L. They're in some foliation. Yeah, I can just, I don't need colors for this one. I don't know. Uh, great, so now I have to find things. We proved last time that the non-corner fixed points are dense, meaning somewhere in this open region and somewhere in, I don't know, this open region, I can find uh, points that are the fixed points of elements which are not corners of any lozenges. Okay, so this is gonna be fixed by uh, alpha and this point is a not corner and somewhere in here I can find one also. Great. This means that uh, because these leaves are non-separated, I see a picture like this, uh, right? These are both in the blue foliation. I have taken these in different complementary regions of these. This picture is not a lie. The positive, the, the red and blue leaves of these two uh, non-corner points cannot possibly intersect, right? These, uh, I have set it up this way. Mm -hmm. So this implies that there exist alpha, beta, uh, 
non-corner fixed points and that they are unlinked in our words from last time, meaning that the, the leaves to these points do not intersect each other. Okay. Now we run the proof from last time. Ah, which I'll say the conclusion, this says that for uh, high enough power, some high power, at least, actually, well, it just gave us existence. Um, as a proof by contradiction, there exists some n m so that alpha and beta m did not have a fixed point in the play. Okay. And how did this run? Uh, since it was at the end, let me remind you, what we did is we considered some compactification of this plane, right? And you consider how these act now on the boundary, which has nice, simple dynamics. These are not corners. These become the unique fixed points of these two elements. And uh, if you always saw some fixed point of a high power, you would produce a sequence of leaves that uh, accumulated onto their attracting fixed points and you would by you know some basic argument with your foliation find a corner okay. and this is where non-corner comes into play drawing this picture you could probably even cheat because you have some more structure here but this is part of a more general theorem yeah uh, great Thanks. Also, alpha and beta are not the identity. Um, this is a worse typo, though. Okay. So, yeah. So this cross, uh, something is missing in the, it's written, not true, right? As it's written, it's not true. Um, you know, it's not because you have two, I mean, as, you know, for the case of geodesic code, you can have two elements alpha beta and two fixed points. Mm -hmm. Some combination of them is not the result of this The problem is when when you're not in the lozenge. Oh, when I'm not in the lozenge. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, well, it's not for all alpha beta. That's it's for all n there exists n beta during the problem n minus n. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here. But Uh, yeah, yeah, so what do I want here? I want to say that there... Uh, it's like, you know, for all n in Z, you can find either n, and all n in either n or minus n. Yeah, 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 yeah. for all n, there exists... Uh, for all n... such that for all m in n. There we go. All right, and here I want an exact inverse statement of this, and here it didn't matter whether I passed to inverses here or not. So this is for all choice uh, alpha plus minus beta plus minus beta minus plus. There exists m n in n. Great. There, okay. These things, uh, yeah. Uh, the, these things are are uh, unreasonably nuanced. If you once you get the right statement, then you just do a little work and you you can you can get the proof. But you get the wrong statement and you're out of the sunk. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, great, good. Okay, all right. So exercise. Check that this one is at now stated correctly and. Uh, Consequence is that um, if I have two actions and they give exactly the same elements that have fixed points, then uh, so this is uh, I'm acting on some a priori completely different bifoliated planes.
And if I, but if I detect the same elements with fixed points, then uh, the first plane is skew if and only if the second plane is skew. OK. OK, proof exactly what I wrote down. These possibilities are mutually exclusive. OK, so this is the first baby step to seeing that if uh, you have the various actions and you know the elements uh, that have fixed points, you can start reconstructing the plane. OK, so at this point, if you want to really do the reconstruct the plane, uh, The, the proof completely bifurcates. You have to treat the skew and the non-skew case separately. The skew case, you know what the plane is already, right? And you're trying to conjugate some group actions. And in the non-skew case, the plane is some crazy thing, and you're trying to recover it, and then in some, some natural way show that it's homeomorphic. And if you succeed in that, probably you've already sh shown the group action and they're conjugate, because what else were you going on? So at this point, skew versus non-skew are just completely different styles of argument. Um, separate. And there's, there's sort of no hope of combining them because they're so inherently different. The skew case, Toma and I did in an earlier work, and the non-skew case was years later with Stephen Frankel. Um, I'm going to focus on the non-skew case to give you some, because that's sort of, you know, those are the interesting and poorly understood bifoliated planes, and that will give you a, a, a taste of what we have to do. Okay. So let's do, let's do this one. And what we're trying to do, we're going to assume, you know, I have two actions like this. And we want to build some kind of homeomorphism I don't know, I'll call it H from my first plane to my second plane that sends the pair of foliations here to the pair of foliations there. All right. So it and it should intertwine the group actions conjugating actions preserving the bifoliated structure. Okay. Take this back to go all the way up. Okay. So In this uh, non-skew case, we, our work last time set us up for at least a good candidate for this H defined on a dead set. That's somewhere to get started. Um, uh, so we have a good candidate for H at least to get started. defined on a dense subset. And what is, what is, what is this? Um, so last time we defined, we talked about non-corner fixed points, right? If I take some point in my first plane, and it's a not corner, and it's fixed by the action of some element of my group, OK, that means it's the unique fixed point of that element. Whenever I see two, I can connect them by some chain of lozenges. OK, uh, then you want to show that it actually takes some work. Uh, uh, so let's see. 
I know this is before the work comes out. I know because the set of elements that have fixed points are the same. I know that this guy, the same element, fixes some point in the second plane, right? If it had a unique point, that would be great. I would send x to that point. And that's the obvious map between the planes that'll interact, intertwine the actions. So I know this has a fixed point. And what you need to show is that is unique, i.e. it's a non-corner. Okay. And, and to do that, well, that's exactly, you know, exactly where I got into the weeds up here is what saves you here. There's a difference between positive and negative iterates when you happen to be uh, you happen to have corners of a lozenge. So now fixed points come in pairs where one expands on one foliation and the other contracts that same foliation. That's corner behavior. Uh, versus non-corner behavior, well, whatever G's doing, it's either expanding or contracting the one leaf and you don't get a choice. All right. And so if you play with that, to the maximum and do a game like this, like who, what positive powers, what signs get fixed points when I compose, when I rearrange things, when I find something else that has a fixed point inside of here, uh, uh, you obtain this. Okay. okay. Okay, great, okay. So if you believe that this work can be done, uh, then I have a good candidate so we're going to define this, define h of x to be, I don't know, let's call this uh, x prime or something like this. Whenever I see a non-corner fixed point, I can send it to the unique non-corner fixed point of the same element on the next, on the other plane. Okay. We did a little proof from the axioms that the non-corner fixed points were dense. So this gives me a map, so far with zero extra properties, except uh, you know, it sort of respects the action of individual elements somewhere because it sends their fixed point to their fixed point. Uh, and that's defined on a dense set. Of non-corner fixed points. Okay, um, and so that's our candidate, and, and you have to show that this actually, you know, well, if it's continuous, it has a unique extension to the plane, and that better be the map that you wanted, that intertwines the actions and is a homeomorphism from your first bifoliated plane to the other. So what you want to do is build up bit by bit properties that suggest that this naively defined map really is the one that you wanted. Okay, so not too hard. So this is what we need. H extends to a homeomorphism of bifoliated planes, so any foliation to foliation. So it has to preserve all the structure. All right. All right. Not too hard to start is that it preserves sort of the most basic structure you could ask for, which is where it's defined, it preserves intersections of leaves or not. All right, so here's a first lemma slash exercise. Um, if I take two points in my first plane, and I happen to have the configuration I drew last time where x, remember these are non-corner fixed points, so this is fixed by some guy, uh, fixed by, I don't know, alpha, and I have some y that's fixed by beta, and if they're leaves, intersect as much as possible, 
So this is what we called totally linked. All right. Then uh, h of x and h of y, these are some fixed points of the same elements, but now with a new action on a new plane, uh, these also are totally linked. So the, the first detector that this is preserving the, the structure of my foliations is true without too much work, right? And that's a souped up version of these things that I tried to, I started last time, but in an effort to simplify, did not get, get completely worked. So this is, this is, you can detect total link linkedness from knowing who, what powers of who has fixed points or not. All right, so this was, last times sketch, or a bigger version of that, detecting linkedness from knowing the set of elements that has fixed points. Okay, so that's not too hard, but uh, it, that's, that's kind of the only tool we have. Uh, or that, that was the easy tool, and now I have a small hammer and I would like to knock down an entire house. Okay, and that's, uh, I would love for someone to have a better proof than like take your hammer and knock down the house one brick at a time, but that's how it goes. Okay, so let me give you a sample of how you use this kind of hammer to knock down a house. So now we want to recover the entire structure of some bifoliated planes. So now we need something like, uh, let me, let me uh, whoop, get a whole new board so I can state something complicated. So I have my not too hard H preserves linking property lemma. Now I want to improve this. to say various iterations of H preserves the whole structure of my foliations. Whenever I see lozenges, I should send them to lozenges, et cetera. All right, so for instance, uh, you know, if I have an, a, a point, if X in P1 happens to be a lozenge whose corners are fixed by some particular element G, row one G, my first action. So, you know, uh, I have some picture like this. These don't meet, these do meet. This is a G invariant set here. And I have some point X that's a non-corner. Uh, well, I have a map H that's supposed to send X somewhere. Uh, if H really extends to a homeomorphism, then inside of P2, here's P1, here's P2, H of X better lie inside a lozenge fixed by the action of G on this plane, right? then uh, we would need to show that h of x is in a lozenge fixed by row two of g. So somewhere here, I don't know, however it sits, is some set invariant under row 2G that forms a loss engine, you know, yeah, if this is the conjugacy between my actions, that better be true. Okay, but even like worse than that, right? If I have an X and a Y that happen to both sit inside the same lozenge versus different ones, they better go in not just two arbitrary lozenges fixed by row two of G, it might fix an infinite chain of them, uh, in the same 
was n, right? Otherwise, no hope of being a homeomorphism that conjugates these actions. Okay, so let me show you how we rephrase these properties in terms of the small hammer that just tells you if where I'm, this map is defined, things intersect or not. Okay. Uh, whoop. Where can I fit these? Uh, let's put this one. Okay, so before I do my edits of the same with this yellow, let's start with a little simpler situation. Here's a lemma. Let me get this right, because as we've seen when I improvise, I get things wrong. This is the in versus out lemma. So assume x is not a corner. It's a non-corner fixed point in uh, some row, one or two doesn't matter, g invariant lozenge. Um, ah, no, let's do the two cases separately. Okay. If X is in uh, some rho G invariant Los Edge, maybe you call it L, it looks like this, then What behavior will I see? So let's erase y, my over-enthusiastic y's from my picture. Uh, what is the action of row 1g on this? Well, it preserves this for Lagrange. So wherever it sends x, it's going to still be in the Lagrange, right? As I iterate, I'll stay in here. I'll move around. Actually, the dynamics shift kind of points from one corner towards the other, right? But that's not important to right now. What's important is that if I take any power of x, it still lies in this Lagrange. So here's rho 1g to the any integral power of x. It's somewhere in the Los edge. Well, how do its stable and unstable leaves behave? These are forced to cross both sides of the Los edge. The Los edge inside here is a trivially foliated region. It just looks like a patch of R2. The interesting behavior is at the edges. Right. So what does this mean wherever these sit? Well, they're sitting inside something that looks like a piece of trivially foliated R2. So the, they're, they're, these points are totally linked. So then for all uh, powers, x is totally linked. With g to the n of x, well, rho g to the n of x. Uh, versus if I'm not inside a uh, G invariant lozenge, so find some power where this breaks. So that's one. And two, if X is, uh, so I, here I'm, I'm uh, considering lozenges to also include G invariant leaves. So I should say, or on a G invariant leaf. If I picked, I don't know, two points on the edge of this, right, then, uh, well, they'll both always stay, be, stay on the same G invariant leaf. So by some trivial version of foliations intersecting, they'll continue to be totally linked. Fine. Uh, so here I can say, if not, well, this one's harder to check, right, because you need to say, all right, uh, what happens out of, what are the dynamics of G outside of its lozenges? Uh, uh, but essentially, it sends points off to infinity, and you can exploit this. If not, there exists some power such that x uh, is not totally linked with rho g to the n of x. Mm -hmm. Maybe why you should believe this, I don't know, if, if, if with every power in both directions I was totally linked, I would take g, I would start doing, I would start applying its iterates. I have my x 
I apply an iterative g, yes, now I'm still totally linked, so this gives me a trivially foliated little box. I apply a, a more and more in both directions, I will find some g invariant subset that's trivially foliated, like an R2 inside my plane, that's what total linkedness gives me, it gives me little rectangles with a trivial foliation, and those should, you know, union out to form a lozenge. Okay, but great. The upshot is that uh, you can argue that total linkedness is, just knowing our small hammer on total linkedness tells you whether you're in a G invariant lozenge or not. All right. Okay, so now to, to, to impress you with our virtuoso ability to detect the plane by uh, uh, just knowing linkedness properties, I'm gonna state but not prove at all uh, the, the version of being in the same lozenge. So I think it's, it's worth appreciating the statement. So here's lemma two. So now I have x, y, they are non-corner fixed points. You know, one's fixed by alpha, one's fixed by beta, it doesn't matter. And, uh, and maybe I applied my first test before, and I know each of them sits in a lozenge invariant under G. Each in some row, say row one, row two, doesn't matter, invariant lozenge. Okay. How am I gonna detect if they're in the same lozenge? versus different, well, I need a criterion. So let's draw a picture of two points in the same lozenge. Here's a lozenge. And I see, I don't know, x, y. Um, well, okay, here's something that I can just tell you by magic is happens to be true. Um, Let's consider this po a point here, P, outside of my lozenge, but you know, close to one of its corners. Okay. I'm gonna take it close enough so this point P is totally linked with both X and Y. Okay. I can find such a point if I see two points in the same lozenge. Okay, so there exists some P. P is, let me abbreviate totally linked with to TLX, and P is totally linked with Y. Okay. Uh, and if you want, you can take P, non-corner fixed points are dense, so I can take P that's non-corner. Unfortunately, this is not good enough. You can have two points in different lozenges where this is still true. Maybe Y, you know, happened to be in some lozenge that, that hung out over here. Okay, or maybe you just take P inside, I don't know, you know, there are many, many options. This is not a detector yet. All right. um, however, uh, now I'm gonna consider some finite sequence of iterates of X and Y under G. So if I take, uh, if I apply the action of G uh, up to its inverse, it will start to move X and Y towards one corner, and its inverse will move them towards the other corner. So let's consider finitely many iterates of these points that will still lie in some compact region, uh, and here's some bunch of iterates G to the M X and g to the m y for m in you know some bounded interval. Okay. All right. They start to move towards the corners, but they, if I take some finitely many, they stay in some compact regions. Okay. So I fixed this n. Uh, so here's my claim for any choice of bound there. There exists some non-corner point Q, 
depending on n. Uh, that's not totally linked. I could say unlinked with p. I'm going to put it over here. But that is totally linked with all of these finitely many iterates. OK, so that q and t l x to g to the uh oh, m x and g to the m y for all m inside my bounds. OK. And why does this depend on it? Uh, if I make a random choice of q like this, and I take, because this makes a perfect fit there, if I take a super duper high iterate of x under g, it's going to go hang out in this corner. And eventually, it will not totally link any fixed choice of point anymore. But if I stop my bound somewhere, I can choose a point close enough to the corner so that I remain totally linked with everyone in my compact set. OK, okay so this uh, picture proof is meant to convince you that this condition is true when I do have points in the same lozenge. And the hard work is to show the converse. This statement, in terms of there exist points totally linkage, is the if and only if. That exactly detects the phenomenon of being in the same versus being at different lozenges. There's no way I will prove that on the board for you now. Um, and if you really want to be impressed, we proved something like this for pseudo Anasov flows where these are allowed to be singular points. And so you can try and do some complicated exercise of how you would rephrase this condition if you can't just put a point beside the corner because there's more leaves going out. Okay. But for the non-experts, ignore that side remark. Okay, so where are we in the story? Uh, uh, Using my small hammer, eventually we're able to rephrase in this linking condition things that uh, uh, are preserved by H. So H preserves this idea of, of total linking versus not, right? And this is a characterization of lozenges completely in terms of total linking versus not, right? So this, what this means is that H where defined sends non-corner points, right? All of these are in terms of non-corners and total linking uh, in same G lozenge to same lozenge. Okay. A good first step to this is a nice continuous map between your planes. Okay, so what we do is in the end is show many further steps like this okay. that uh, not only does it preserve this, it preserves everything you, you actually want. H really does extend continuously, this naively defined map, to a homeomorphism P1 to P2 conjugating the two actions of my group. Unless, oh no, one very particular thing happens, which is that my plane had somehow a region of so much symmetry that nothing I could phrase in terms of linking or non-linking could possibly save me. You need a different hammer, except there's no hope of a different hammer because actually uh, there are situations in which this does not work. All right. So unless uh, P1 contains a very, very symmetric region called a tree of scalloped regions. So now I get to unveil the mysterious definition of what happens. Uh, what is this? 
definition. So this is something you see in a bifoliated plane. They really arise in, from Anasov flows. These correspond exactly to when you have a Anasov flow uh, on a three manifold and you see in its JSJ decomposition some ciphered fibered piece. One of your geometric pieces is ciphered fibered. And the fiber direction happens to be represented by a closed orbit of the flow. That is what gives rise to this type of phenomenon. Um, uh, plus something, well, yeah, they don't, let me brush things under the rug, man. There's, this was already a complicated statement. Uh, plus, plus something about the, if you, with the boundary regions, there are other generators for pi one also being periodic orbits. Okay, so Thomas mentions this because it sounds like a rare condition, but there are many examples thanks to this, these constructions uh, of, of, uh, of, of Thierry and Sergio. Okay. okay, so what is this tree of scalloped regions? That Remember, we're, we're talking about planes rather than flows here. So here's the definition. A tree of scalloped regions, uh, this is uh, open set T of your plane, okay? that uh, consists of a union of uh, lozenges, all invariant by the same element, mm -hmm. and uh, so that it has the kind of the maximal symmetry possible such that each lozenge in T is surrounded on all its four sides by other lozenges in T. Uh, each lozenge in T is adjacent on all sides to others. Okay, so what's the picture? Uh-oh. Uh, I have some lozenge here, okay, and on uh, this side there's another lozenge, and on this side there's another lozenge, and on this side there's another one, okay, that's a corner, so that has to be a non-corner, uh, and then on this side there's also another one, so here's my other two non-corners and there's a corner, and then I keep going, here there's another one, and here there's another one, and here's another one, and whatever, you have this infinite region. Okay. Uh, this is so symmetric that this kind of linking property can, 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 can never sort of detect uh, whether you're in the same or different lozenges uh, within this region. Or, this is not a button. And in these cases, you really can uh, produce flows and this is sort of work in progress is to state this in the maximum generality possible, is that, that, that excluding this is a necessary hypothesis. It wasn't just that we didn't have enough tools. Uh, there exist genuine transitive anos of flows on three manifolds. Transitive, where this behavior really occurs with uh, trees of scalloped regions in their orbit spaces. Mm -hmm. Where knowing the set of periodic orbits, P phi, or equivalently, the set of fixed points of the actions is not enough to uh, determine the flow up to orbit equivalence. We really can't build examples. But the good thing is that there's only one thing that can go wrong, and it's this tree of scalloped regions, and there's only one more piece of data that you need 
which is sort of for each one of these or for each one of these totally periodic ciphered pieces, you just need kind of a sign. There's, there's one sort of hidden symmetry of this thing that respects the match, map H as, as, as we've defined so far, but does not lead to a homeomorphism of the plane. That extra choice is basically a sign choice for each of these. Okay. So need basically kind of some sign data for each such region. So we do have a complete invariant. It's just uh, has to take these things into account. Hmm? Why scalloped? This, this tree of scalloped region. Why scalloped? Ah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> what's the word? So scalloped was called. If I take an infinite, just just a, take a bunch of these that are parallel, all in one direction. All right. It, this goes on forever. Okay, but these leaves have to limit onto something in my plane. It turns out, you can prove with a bunch of work, that somehow at the border of this, I see uh, an infinite union of non-separated leaves. All right. And there's also a way to decompose each line like this into lozenges in the opposite direction. Wait, wait. All right. And this is something studied by, uh, by uh, uh, Barbo and Fenley uh, in, in their work on Anasov flows in dimension three, and they named this a scalloped region because I don't know, it's got these nice little uh, shapes in both directions. <laughs> yeah? Like the ocean. Yeah, oh, sure. <laughs> I didn't make the word. Uh, so, but anyway, this tree has them everywhere. Yeah. Great. Okay. I quasi-advertised some questions slash applications, so let me just conclude. Ah, ah, wait, actually, I owe you two things and I have two minutes, so let's do one minute on each. <laughs> Everyone's trying to come up with a better name for scallops. Yeah, don't, don't take it up with me. All right. Uh, one is, what, what is this axiom doing? I didn't tell you where we used it or whatever. Here's where you have to use it. If your whole thing is about who in, what leaves intersect what, if I saw this region in my plane, this never occurs in the Anasov flows case. If I saw a region like this in a bifoliated plane, then we have no hope because every leaf that intersects this blue one also intersects that blue one. And same with the red one. Every leaf that intersects this red one also intersects that red one. If I see kind of a square of perfect fits, then none of my topology of foliations based on who for intersects who can distinguish these pairs. So, you're hopeless, you throw that out. That's, that's so, somehow has to be ruled out or else we don't know what to do. All right. Okay, uh, let me do one minute of what to do next, um, just to leave you with something. All right, maybe I'll be very selective. The big question, is, uh, here is a big question, does there exist a compact uh, three manifold with, that supports infinitely many non-orbit equivalent uh, Anasa flows? Right. This appears to be a big and hard question uh, maybe someone will have an example for us soon or not. Uh, one application, well, of this theory of, well, if you know the set of elements with fixed points, maybe plus some sign data if they're scalloped one, gives, gives you uh, an answer in the setting of contact Denosov flows, okay? So uh, if you import as a giant black box uh, some cylindrical contact homology stuff, okay, uh, you get that uh, there does not exist that supports infinitely many inequivalent contact Anasov flows. 
The other applications we get is just, this gives you kind of a toolkit. If you wanted to understand the symmetries of a given flow, if, you, someone, if someone gave you, jo Jonathan might speak on this in his talk a little bit or some related stuff, we'll see. Um, uh, if, if you wanted to, if someone gave you, a, in a, 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 if you had a three manifold that you really want, and a flow you really wanted to understand, you might ask yourself like, well, what are the symmetries of this? What are the self-orbit equivalences? Are there non-isotopically trivial maps of your manifold that send the flow to itself, right? And this gives you a toolkit to understand and classify them. And we can do this in some examples. Um, let me not take anyone's break. And you should ask me if you're excited to hear my other ideas on questions. Uh, but we'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks.